good afternoon everyone thank you for the invite to be here it's my first ISAM uh, it's absolutely amazing I'm an addiction medicine PhD student at St Andrews in Scotland and I wanted to give a sense of the kind of results and the kind of engagement we can get from uh, these national projects and I'm going to be reporting some initial results from the survey around um, the people's experiences of telemedicine for opioid use disorder treatment. I'm presenting on behalf of myself and the principal investigator for the study, Dr. Joe Tay, who's over in San Francisco at the moment, so can't be with us. I'll give a brief introduction and background, outline some results from the survey and mention next steps. And a quick warning, I'm going to be seeking support and engagement from people to be involved in a follow-on Delphi study if anyone's interested. So get ready for me giving a big push to that opportunity. So as we all know, opioid use disorder uh, is a significant driver of um, mortality and morbidity among people who use drugs. We're all well aware of the ongoing drug death crises in North America and Europe, especially Scotland. And despite the being evidence-based medication, as Fatima's slides that she just showed, I was astonished to see countries where some basic medications for opioid use disorder aren't available. We know there are treatment gaps. Telemedicine to deliver opioid use disorder treatment involves using audio or video consultation techniques and through which we can diagnose, prescribe medications and offer people treatment and support and motivation uh, to address their addiction. There's been a large amount of interest and some activity in publications on telemedicine for medication for OUD during and post the COVID pandemic. And in general, this work's coming out of North America. Can we do something to make it a little more equitable and get uh, opinions and experiences from around the world? We shall see. And so TMOOD, as I'll abbreviate it, has real potential to reduce barriers to access and engagement to treatment and address that treatment gap. So there are some key research gaps. As I've mentioned, the bulk of the evidence comes from some really valuable experiences across the USA and Canada, but there's a dearth of information from around the rest of the world, especially countries that the World Bank classes as low and middle income. There's also a lack of guidance on how to deliver safe and effective treatment over video and audio links. This is a real barrier to uptake and delivery of such services. And again, something we need to understand better in order to address. So this study uh, undertaken through the ISAMGEN program, um, there are two parts to it. The first is um, nearing completion. And there are final opportunities for people to get involved and give the views if they wish. And it's an international survey to understand people's views and experiences of T-Mood. People were eligible to participate whether or not they, their service, their region or even their country are currently delivering this or not. So this survey is not just about how do you do it, but it's about do you? If yes, how? And if not, why? So we've tried to be quite um, encompassing of people's experiences. The follow-on work we'd like to uh, develop is um, developing some jurisdictionally relevant guidance uh, through a Delphi process to develop consensus on best practice in delivering T-Mood. And today I'm going to share preliminary results from the initial survey. So as of the 1st of September, we had 42 participants since then, that's gone up to, I think, 55. So this is increasing day on day. We have representation from 28 countries. As is a real strength of ISAM, it's not limited to English speaking, developed or high income countries. We have representation from all continents in the world. 
Um, sure, the majority of responses, nearly half are from what are classed as high income countries, but crucially we're getting the experiences of people in a wider range of settings. Maybe reflecting the ISOMGEN membership, um, of which I'm one, it's a slightly older um, age group of participants. And again, reflecting the ISOMGEN membership, possibly of which I'm one, uh, predominantly male. Um, so we definitely welcome uh, a, a wider range of age groups and especially our female respondents. So we ask people about current use of telemedicine in their country or jurisdiction. A quick aside, you might wonder why I talk about country and jurisdiction. And it's because we wanted to be mindful and respectful of the fact that in some parts of the world, a country might have a national policy that affects practice across the whole of that country. But thinking about maybe, for example, Canada, you've got some centralised policies and guidance, but then there are very different opportunities and ways of practising in different jurisdictions. So hence the distinction. So for, um, we asked about, was there any use of um, T-Mood before COVID? And um, just over half of places there were. Was this more common following COVID? Massively so. So clearly the pandemic was an opportunity and a driver uh, for this method of uh, treatment delivery. Um, so I wanted to highlight those in particular as being relevant. And I won't speak in detail of the others, just to say that over half of countries and jurisdictions had some guidelines for general healthcare delivery over video and audio links, um, but much less experience of being practices in place for clinicians and services to be reimbursed for that method of delivery and whether that reimbursement excluded audio only and required video consults. And another thing to highlight is thinking about barriers. Okay, there may have been some team mood before COVID and it may have increased during the pandemic. However, 60% of participants said their guidelines exclude controlled drugs, i.e. exclude the ability to prescribe and monitor evidence-based treatments for opioid use disorder. So we're seeing a bit of a tension between the ability to have contact with patients and the ability to provide the kind of interventions and treatments they need. Just to say, when we asked about whether there was any telemedicine for opioid use disorder before COVID, um, we saw the point is not working. The bottom part of the chart is responses from low and middle income countries. The green column is yes. And we wanted to highlight that we are not just seeing experience of T-Mood in high income countries. We're seeing it across a wide range of settings. So this genuinely has potential to be a global series of interventions to reduce uh, barriers to access. So thinking of barriers, we asked about clinical system. These are the top seven. There were 23 in total. I'm gonna to show you the top seven and the bottom seven. Um, we thought it was significant that the most commonly identified barriers were associated with systems. The, the ability of clinical systems to manage that method of service delivery, guidance from organizations, support from people with power, um, incentives and um, drug monitoring. So the majority of the most common barriers are system related. And despite what maybe the literature suggests, despite what some conversations I pick up on, actual clinician led barriers of um, lacking experience and training and feeling that assessment isn't possible aren't the most common. The main barriers are based within systems. Thinking of the bottom seven of barriers, um, okay, 41% of clinicians think that there are real issues regarding the safety of delivering treatment for opioid use disorder via telemedicine. And that's valid given the concerns around not only potential toxicities of the treatments, 
and about issues of people continuing to use substances, um, but also the, the, the safety of the, the quality of interaction they have. So yeah, the, one of the highest of the bottom seven barriers does relate to patient safety, maybe suggesting there is a need for some evidence-based guidance. Um, clinicians highlighted also communication difficulties. Do we have the same quality of interaction with patients when it's just done over the telephone or a Teams or video link? And finally, um, we were wanting to flag it was the very bottom identified barrier, but there were perceptions it increases workload. And in some qualitative work, clinicians told us a real challenge is that sometimes video consults were being squeezed into what would otherwise be downtime. And there can be a little bit of creep where they were seeing patients out with dedicated clinic times. Another reason we've highlighted these are, sure, these are important barriers that we need to understand and address, but these are also the barriers with the highest number of grey, undecided responses. And it's important to focus on the clear yes and no's. It's also important to understand where clinicians are undecided or unsure. Again, is there more work we can do with research? with consensus development and guideline development through ISAM to reduce the undecideds. Many clinicians have got little or no experience of delivering T-Mood. How can we make that a safer and more comfortable process for both clinicians and patients? Again, I won't go through all the country level responses in detail, but I did want to highlight that one of the barriers we asked about was, is lack of patient demand a barrier? This means, are patients not interested in having telephone and video consults? And you'll see the purple column where respondents disagreed that was a barrier is the most populated. And that applies whether you're looking at high or low and middle income countries. The message is clear. Patient, the clinicians believe that their patients find this an acceptable and accessible means of engaging in treatment and care. So we can do away with the myth that, well, patients prefer to come in and see us in person. Patients, it seems, are asking for that choice. So takeaways. Um, it seems there is a significant demand for audio and video provided uh, treatment for opioid use disorder across the globe in a range of settings. Generally, this isn't being met and the fewer clinicians said that they were delivering that service in their countries compared to those who thought there was an appetite for it. And this is especially an issue, maybe a barrier in low and middle income countries. Despite current assumptions that you see hinted at in discussions of published literature and in conversations with colleagues, even here, people tend to think that clinician concerns might be a bigger barrier. You're telling us those issues and barriers exist within the systems for prescribing and monitoring and offering appointments and even supervising your practice within your countries and settings. There was a very strong endorsement on the need for some best practice, best practice guidance. Hence, we're very keen to follow on with the Delphi study uh, that I'll mention in a second. And as I've highlighted, there were significant numbers, around a fifth of respondents were undecided on the barriers associated with clinical risk, issues of communication online, an impact on your workload. So there are specific gaps in evidence and experience that we can address. So next steps, as I mentioned, the survey is still recruiting. I think we're holding it open till, it'll be closed definitely by the end of this month. So please drop me an email if you want to participate and we'll send you a link. We will provide a more full report on survey findings uh, in the next few months. 
and there does seem to be an appetite, not only among us, but among our respondents for some global consensus statements on best practice for TMUD. And we need this to be jurisdictionally based rather than global. There's no good one country telling another country how to deliver TMUD if the context of regulation and policy and the legal frameworks are different. We have a Delphi survey developed and ready to go. It'll be quite demanding, taking maybe over an hour to complete, but we shall be piloting that, so watch this space. Things that I'm keen to discuss beyond the five seconds I have remaining, let's pick that up over the next two days. I'd like to acknowledge a range of organizations and especially our study advisory group. Thank you.